I'm free market think tanks from all across Europe, um, and we're here to discuss the many state index and lifestyle regulations all across Europe. Um, I spend the majority of my time in the bureaucratic bubble of Brussels, um, where the slogan smart regulation has been quite prominent in recent years. Uh, Mr. Juncker, the former president of the European Commission, uh, mentioned that he wants the EU to be big on big things and small on small things. And I would believe that lifestyle regulations are rather part of the small things uh, within Europe, um, but that's not always represented um, in the European Commission or in member states. Um, so I have two fantastic speakers on my right hand and left hand side, and I'm delighted to introduce you Lasse Pipinen, who is the director of Libra, which is a free market think tank in Finland, a non-profit, non-partisan organization, um, who is promoting liberal free market issues, um, mostly in Finland. And on my left hand side, I have Christopher Snowden, who is the head of lifestyle unit at the Institute of Economic Affairs. The IA is the original free market think tank in the UK, and it's celebrating its 65th anniversary this year. And Chris is specifically focusing on pleasure, prohibition, and dodgy statistics. And Chris is the author of a number of books, and he's also the editor of the Nanny State Index, the publication that you find, many of you find in your hands or at the entrance on the table. Um, so welcome, gentlemen. It's a great pleasure to have you here. Um, I would like to start up with Chris um, as the editor of the Nanny State Index, um, which is a league table of all EU member states when it comes to lifestyle regulations. How did you come up with the index, why do you think it's important, and what do you think the key takeaways of the research are? Okay, yes, a lot of questions there. Um, I came up with the idea of doing it having seen other similar indexes of you know, human freedom, prosperity, economic freedom, um, and there was no similar publication showing uh, nanny state scores. I should explain what we mean by nanny state. It's obviously a slightly pejorative term, and, and that's no coincidence. Um, but when we're looking in terms of regulation, we are only including laws and taxes and bans if they are more or less explicitly designed to put people off buying the products or engaging in the activity. We're not interested in general health and safety regulations. Um, we are not interested either in regulations that are specifically uh, targeted at children, so a ban on e-cigarettes being sold to children, for example, we wouldn't consider to be uh, nanny state policies. We're looking at paternalistic regulation that is mainly focused on adults and which effectively raise the costs or reduce the benefits of engaging in particular um, activities. Specifically, we look at alcohol, food, soft drinks, tobacco, and e-cigarettes. Uh, we are looking at possibly expanding that when the next index comes out in 2021. There's talk of including cannabis in there now that Luxembourg is set to legalize that. Um, but hopefully you get the idea. It's um, anything that's designed to deter people from uh, engaging in something that may carry some risk, but uh, you know, the, the risk of which is already known to them. Um, what the index shows, I think, primarily, is that there is a huge range of, um, of different policies in, in different countries. At the top of the table, the, the biggest nanny state has been Finland in all three of the editions we've had so far. In the uh, last, most recent edition, Germany is, is the freest country, uh, and there's a massive gap between the scores of those two countries. Um, we, um, we see a fair bit of movement between each edition. Uh, for example, between 2017 and 2019, Lithuania really shot up the charts, Estonia also. Um, 
we tend to see, this probably won't surprise you, we tend to see more regulations every time we do the index um, and very few examples of regulations being relaxed or repealed, although it, it does occasionally happen, which is good, but generally it's a kind of down, downward spiral from our uh, point of view. Um, the big change over the last couple of years has been the rise in the number of countries that are taxing e-cigarette fluid. Uh, and also the, the, an increase in the number of countries that are banning vaping in so-called public places. Um, that, I guess, is not too surprising, given that e-cigarettes are by far the, the youngest kind of product category that we, uh, we look at in the index. But yeah, there is a huge range of, um, of policies from the, the uh, least liberal countries to the most liberal countries, and the EU itself doesn't really play a huge part in it. Um, so if we're talking about EU smart regulation, there is simply no nanny state regulation from Brussels when it comes to food, soft drinks, uh, or alcohol. There's nothing at all. That may change in the future, but at the moment, um, you know, there is, for example, no EU sugar tax, although in, in theory, at least, I, I guess there could be. Uh, tobacco and e-cigarettes are a different matter. Um, there have been two or three tobacco product directives now, and the last tobacco product directive did include e-cigarettes and brought in some, um, in my opinion, fairly petty and unnecessary regulations of the uh, emerging vaping market. And the EU has tended to go a bit further than most member states when it comes to tobacco regulation. Um, so graphic warnings, for example, came in last time. There is a ban on menthol cigarettes due to take place in May, despite the fact that not a single EU country has actually banned menthol cigarettes or even really seriously discussed doing so. So I think some of the market harmonization arguments used to justify regulation of e-cigarettes and tobacco in the EU are pretty shaky. Um, I think they are more or less obviously designed actually as paternalistic regulation, which domestic governments are quite capable of bringing in themselves, as the nanny state index shows, they are more than capable in, in some parts of uh, the continent of bringing them in. Other countries are more reluctant to uh, bring them in. But overall, the EU doesn't play a big uh, role in, in dictating the scores, which is to say, in closing, that each country has a great deal of uh, freedom, a good deal of uh, latitude in uh, whether it wants to introduce these kind of policies or not. And finally, I should just say, we also do look at the, the, um, the effects of the, the, the policies. Um, as I say, um, most of these do kind of raise the cost, uh, literally, in the case of taxes, but also in, in other um, uh, more intangible ways. So they do have negative effects. As for the positive effects, nearly all of the policies that we look at are designed uh, to, in some way, improve health, but if you actually chart the nanny state index scores against uh, outcomes such as life expectancy or the smoking rate or the uh, per capita alcohol consumption, there isn't really any correlation actually uh, between them. So they, 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 there is no obvious positive effect from them, but there are um, quite obvious negative effects. Chris, you call these policies paternalistic and petty, um, but certainly when politicians are introducing these various regulations, they justify it because they want to make their own citizens healthier, live longer, and be more prosperous. So the four categories that you measure in the index, um, food, alcohol, tobacco, and vaping, um, you certainly admit that they are probably not healthy choices if you overeat or if you overdrink and smoke on a regular basis. Um, when politicians introduce these different legislative measures to help their own citizens, what's your reaction? What, why, why do you think that's not occasionally justified to exchange some individual liberties in order to provide for better health outcomes for citizens? Well, because I work from the kind of economist presumption that um, adult consumers are, broadly speaking, rational and reasonably well-informed. Um, that's not to say there is never a, uh, a case for what you might call paternalistic regulation. I mean, there, there is a case for some form of regulation if there is an information asymmetry, which is to say if consumers are kind of systematically 
under-informed or misinformed about a product, then I think you could justify having some kind of uh, either a public campaign to warn people about the risks or even some kind of labelling to let people know about the possible consequences. And if there are external costs, and this is the argument that's often made, if there are external costs, particularly to the healthcare system, um, or in the case of alcohol, um, to the police uh, and uh, judicial system, then you can justify a tax. And there isn't anything wrong with having a Pergovian tax on some of these products. And certainly, I think alcohol um, almost certainly requires one. The economic case, however, actually isn't very strong, um, that there is a net burden on public services. If you look at it in the round, you'll see that um, in most cases, if anything, there's actually a, a saving. So I, I look at it purely as an economic uh, matter, and I think you're right to do so, because you know, the, the economists, uh, again, kind of assume that so long as people are reasonably rational and reasonably well informed, they will make the right decisions for themselves. They know what the risks are, but they also know what the benefits are. And I'm rather skeptical, actually, that a lot of this stuff is done from a genuine desire to make people healthy. It's um, interesting to note what a big part taxation plays in, in the index. And uh, since we started doing it in 2016, the two big developments that we've seen are the expansion of taxes on sugary drinks and taxes on e-cigarette fluid. Now, e taxing e-cigarette fluid is an anti-health measure <laughs> because e-cigarettes are a substitute for much more dangerous uh, combustible cigarettes. Um, sugary drink taxes just don't seem to have any real effect on obesity whatsoever. Um, so these policies look much more like revenue raising measures rather than uh, genuine health policies. Sure. Lasse, you're from Finland, which has consistently ranked as the number one of most paternalistic EU countries in all of the United States indices. But it's also one of the richest and one of the happiest countries in Europe. Um, do you think that's actually because of these nanny state regulations or despite of it? Um, I actually see two reasons for the happiness or claimed happiness of Finns. Um, it's economic growth and nature. And if it has something to do with the paternalistic attitude or the government, um, I, I, don't, I don't actually see it. We're quite happy because Finland was built from the 50s uh, to this date to be a great welfare state. But now our public spending, uh, pu public sector, they're both huge, oversized. And we still believe that if we do public decisions that limits our lives to achieve something greater good, which probably in this case is to not allow people to drink uh, themselves dead. Um, no, they don't combine these two, sorry. Fair enough. Um, but you have many other Nordic countries as well that are equally rich and equally happy um, when, when they conduct these surveys, but they diverge very much in the 90 state index. So if you look at the index, um, you will see that Sweden is also in the top 10, um, I think number eight, but Denmark is ranked very, very low and it's one of the least regulated um, European countries uh, when it comes to life, lifestyle regulations. So how come a lot of the Nordic countries are very similar in a lot of measures, but they diverge that much when it comes to lifestyle regulations. Why is Finland so much out of, um, out of the rest of the Nordic countries? Um, I think that cause, because D Denmark was kind of mainland Europe for a very long time. It, it still kind of is because we can't change the geographics. But Finland was a dark, frozen country far away. Um, it, it was very long, on a European perspective also, uh, a, a, an agricultural country. We developed pretty fast. And then also kind of those good things that came from Europe, like um, wine and um, ability to produce alcohol drinks, uh, cigarettes, uh, drugs eventually. We just didn't know what to do with those. We didn't have the history. And I think that Denmark has had the history uh, longer, so they kind of know more what to do with it. Of course, because 
nowadays on the nanny state index, uh, it shows that they, they, they can afford to raise taxes for alcohol, for instance, because people just would travel to Germany to buy their uh, wines and, and, and vodkas whatsoever. Um, yet the alcohol, overall alcohol consumption uh, in Denmark and Finland is pretty similar. They drink as much as we do. It's a bit lower in Sweden, and no one actually knows why. If I could, if I could just jump in. Um, I mean, Denmark, uh, sorry, Finland is not really an outlier amongst Nordic countries. You have to remember that we haven't got all the Nordic countries in the nanny state index. Iceland isn't in there, Norway isn't in there, because um, so far, at least, it's only been EU countries we've been looking at. But we are looking at including Iceland and Norway next time. And I can tell you that Finland is much much more similar to Norway and Iceland than it is to Denmark. Denmark is more similar to Germany, really. Um, it's an interesting question why the Nordic countries are, are so nanny statist. I think a lot of it comes down to um, alcohol prohibition, which um, Norway uh, had a form of. Iceland had full prohibition, and, uh, and so Finland, Sweden very nearly did, and Sweden is only slightly below Finland, really, in the nanny state index. So um, also, uh, all those countries have a uh, state-owned monopoly for alcohol retail, which none of the other European countries do. So there are many similarities between the Nordic ones. Denmark, if anything, is a slight outlier because it's maybe a bit, bit closer um, to Germany. And on the happiness and, and wealth point, um, well, I'm a bit kind of sceptical about a lot of the, the so-called science of, of happiness, but um, the, you know, countries like Germany and Luxembourg, which are indeed Spain, which are much lower down in, in the league table, also you know pretty prosperous, happy countries as well. So I don't think you can really see um, much of a pattern in in the index, other than that Nordic countries are all pretty high up there. Well, I guess the exception of um, Denmark, and I think that's for historical reasons. I wouldn't say that they are happy because of the nanny state. One common thing um, about the Nordic countries is that we have had, after the war, um, uh, social democrats in power. And that's probably the perspective to individuality, to, to your own decision making, a bit different than the more conservative parties uh, in the Central Europe. Certainly, this culture and political history does matter. Um, you raised an interesting point um, about cross-border trade and Danes traveling to Germany um, to buy cheaper booze. Um, I heard similar stories about Finland as well. Um, apparently, there is a booze cruise between Estonia and Finland. Um, and obviously, one of the key achievements of the European Union is the single market and the fact that we are able to exchange goods without any or very limited restrictions. Um, so do these nanny state regulations even make sense if people actually do have a fairly easy opportunity um, to get around those regulations? And, and what are actually some of the unintended consequences of these lifestyle regulations? This is probably a question for both of you. Um, I can start because it's, it's, it's funny how consumer usually is pretty smart. Um, Swedes used to come to Finland to buy beer because it was stronger and cheaper, but only in Lapland, because we got the common border. So it's easy to cross the border, buy the beer, drive back. And that's the case also in Denmark, of course, with Germany, and with us to Estonia. Um, we kind of played with the idea in Finland, because there are uh, hundreds of thousands of people uh, traveling to Estonia to buy cheaper alcohol. They also raise their um, taxes, so now people are traveling to Latvia. But we kind of played with the idea that we could actually have a village in Finland. We just could build a, a thick wall around and, and, and pretend that this is Tallinn. And people would drive there and they, then would just basically collect the tax, lower tax in that case, to Finland. This kind of shows the absurdity of not having common policies on these very simple drinking, uh, eating, and probably smoking issues in Europe. Yeah, and it also shows that people don't really want these these taxes. I mean, people are going to the enormous effort, really, of, of going over the, the border. Um, then it's just that they are prepared to, to, you know, um, to do all sorts of things in order to get what they see as a reasonable price. And they are not prepared to give taxation to their own government because they feel that they've been 
um, rather penalised by their own government. There are many examples of this happening. When Sweden brought in, uh, sorry, when Denmark brought in its fat tax, there was a lot of cross-border shopping to Germany and even to Sweden. At the moment, uh, the uh, Norwegians are going to Sweden to buy sweets, candy, uh, on a very large scale because the, the Norwegian government uh, hugely increased the tax on sugary products a couple of years ago. Estonia is very interesting while I write about it in the index. Um, they have been increasing their alcohol taxes enormously and it's had exactly the effect that you say. Not only are Finns not going to Estonia to buy their booze, going to Latvia, um, the Estonians are going to Latvia now. And so the Estonian government has had to slash alcohol, alcohol duty because it's about raising revenue at the end of the day. It's about maximizing the revenue. It's not really about health. So these are pretty predictable unintended consequences. Um, but I think the main thing they show is that people don't really want these taxes. But a lot of these unintended consequences that you mentioned are actually legal, right? It's just a way to get around the regulations. Um, but there is also a lot of cross-border trade, especially in the Baltics and some of the Central Eastern European countries, that's illegal, and that's mainly around the tobacco sector. Um, have you actually looked at the various taxation measures in different countries and the impact it has on illegal imports as well? Oh yeah, it's, it's, it's pretty clear. Um, I mean, access to the countries which have the very cheap tobacco is obviously one one factor. So, you know, the countries over in, in the East, which are near places like Russia and Belarus, which in turn are near to China, where a lot of it originally comes from, uh, do have a big problem with the illicit trade. But if you look at the countries that have the highest tax on tobacco, which are the UK and Ireland, they have the highest proportion of their tobacco market um, is illicit. And when you consider how far those countries are from the Eastern European countries that tend to supply them, and that there are islands, um, it's, it's quite remarkable, really, how, how large the, the black market is. Um, so, yeah, there's a very clear correlation between um, you know, very high taxes, not just on alcohol, but on almost anything, and the amount of the product bought from the black market. Well, it's, it's a Friday and you have painted a fairly bleak picture of these regulations here in Europe. Um, have you actually seen any positive changes throughout the various indices where you saw that European countries and governments realized that these lifestyle regulations are not working, they're causing many unintended consequences, they're not leading to better health outcomes, so we're going to reform. Um, do you have any positive examples from the last five years in mind? There's one or two I can think of. Um, I think Spain was going to bring in a sugary drinks tax, I think, and, and, and cancelled it. I know that um, Italy had a very high tax on e-cigarette fluid and, and enormously cut that a year or two ago. Uh, D Denmark got rid of their fat tax pretty quickly. Uh, the Estonians have cut their alcohol duty. I think Latvia has also cut their alcohol duty. Um, so, yeah, there are some, from my perspective, positive steps. Also, quite a few countries, including Finland, have legalized e-cigarettes. I mean, e-cigarettes were totally banned in Finland and in Denmark and in one or two other places. Norway is in the process of legalizing uh, e-cigarettes at the moment. So, um, yeah, it's not all doom and gloom. There has, have been some um, sensible kind of reversals of, of bad policy and damaging taxes. Um, there has also been the last 15, almost 20 years discussion in Germany to limit uh, the time when the alcohol selling is allowed. Um, still not regulated, thank God. So it's a good sign. Um, the kind of the bright light in Finland, this really describes how um, alcohol beverage issues are handled in Finland. Uh, the discussion in the parliament when we liberated our alcohol laws slightly bit. Um, there was one representative who just kept a speech and said that if we're gonna go from 4.7 alcohol volume to 5.5, and that means it's allowed to sell in the supermarket, not in the monopoly, then kids will start eating vodka ice cream. What's the link exactly? What was the logic behind that sentence? I have no idea, but sometimes politics just doesn't follow logistics. But it might change slowly a bit. The problem with these, as, as Chris mentioned, is kind of the health issues. If we would liberate the whole 
alcohol laws in Finland, and what if people would die? Who would take the responsibility? This is kind of a balance of horror in that sense that no one's actually able to do those decisions because they're just scared. A uh, funny thing is that after this very small liberation, the alcohol monopoly stores are an hour longer open in the evening, and then you're allowed to sell alcohol beverages in the supermarket that are not only um, made through fermentation, but that the alcohol can also be distilled up to 5.5 alcohol volume. Um, is that actually the 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 consumption? decreased or it sank a bit. No one knows why. But that's just probably happens if you trust on people. Yeah, individual responsibility is definitely a, a key theme across the discussion. Um, what we haven't discussed yet, and I'm going to open the floor as we have some great experts in the room as well. Um, I would like to hear your thoughts and your questions in a minute. Um, but talking about responsibility. Um, you mentioned politicians um, and collective responsibility, people being afraid or politicians being afraid to pass liberalizing laws. And we discussed individual responsibility as well. Um, but do you think um, corporate responsibility and the kind of new attitudes around business ethics also should play a role when it comes to lifestyle regulations, meaning corporates it being able to provide for healthier versions of various sugar drinks or decreasing the amount of fat in various food or coming up with new tobacco products that are, that are less lethal uh, than the traditional versions. Um, have you seen any kind of movement in that direction? Well, there's been movement in that direction for a long time. I wouldn't call it corporate responsibility. I would just call it meeting consumer demand. Uh, clearly, there is a widespread consumer demand for nicotine products that don't kill you. Um, so, yeah, there, there's been demand, latent demand, for a long time. It's only in relative recent years that it's actually been met. Um, on food and soft drinks, one of the ideas that the UK government, I'm afraid, is um, kind of pioneering and may well spread is um, supposedly voluntary, but in effect coercive um, reformulation of food and drink products to remove the sugar, remove the calories, remove the fat and the salt and, until presumably there's almost nothing in them at all. Um, and this is underway in, in Britain. There are certain targets that the amount of sugar in products must be 20% uh, lower by this year. It's not going to happen. Um, and, and similar targets for, for calories, and uh, there'll be new t targets for salt and fat. <coughs> but this, this has already been happening for a long time. And the only success story the government can point to is that after we introduced a tax on sugary drinks a couple of years ago, uh, a lot of the sugary drinks were reformulated. In actual fact, nearly all of them had already been reformulated. There were diet versions and zero sugar versions of nearly all these drinks to begin with. Um, all that happened was that some of the companies took out a lot of sugar from the, the main traditional brand. And so consumers didn't have that choice anymore. If you're quite happy, like me, to drink a sugary drink, and you'd rather drink a sugary drink than an artificially sweetened drink, um, that choice was was they're, they're after removed. Um, so that wasn't really responding to consumer demand, that was responding to government demand, which is always, of course, a very different thing. That really fights my idea of um, individual freedom, because if we, everyone knows that sugar tastes good. Um, and the means of a government or like public decision making should be actually educated. The problem is that if you tax something, you get money. If you educate, you lose money. So the taxing is the easy instrument to try to affect on consumption or consumer behavior. Um, I don't like it at all. I, I think the individuals should have just um, more information and then decide themselves because it, it, it is quite sure that the companies or the corporates will react on demand. Um, a, a friend of mine uh, went through a fat surgery um, and one of the good advices she got was don't drink your calories. Here's a campaign for you. <laughs>
Certainly. Um, I think the educational parts are also often emphasized, especially by NGOs, um, but taxation is definitely easier than, than education. I would like to open up the discussion and to the whole floor, as um, I'm sure you have some thoughts about um, all sorts of lifestyle regulations. Spain is ranking fairly decently on the index, but I've heard that there are new plans to introduce various uh, regulatory frameworks. Um, so are there any questions on the floor? I have, sure. I have one, one first question. Um, my question, you were speaking about Picovian uh, taxes as a way to uh, reduce the consumption of uh, this, like alcohol, e-cigarettes, or whatever you, you were talking about. And my question is, uh, we can notice right now that these Picovian taxes are not working because people still consume this, this kind of uh, drinks or, or food. So, um, do you think this evidence can help us uh, fighting with, uh, against this regulation? Do you think this is not going to help us at, at all? And what do you think we can do like, to try to explain that this, um, this is something that is related to the, the private uh, sphere or area of individuals and that states shouldn't say what you have or, or you don't have to do in your, in your private life? Chris? Well, it's certainly a useful fact from our point of view that these policies so rarely work uh, in any meaningful sense, do not fulfill the promises of the campaigners. And conversely also, when on the odd occasion when government li liberalizes things, the campaigner says this is going to be the end of the world and, and nothing changes. Um, so the, yeah, the, the lack of efficacy um, should be a powerful argument. And if we're talking about smart regulation, evidence-based policy, it should be paramount. There is, I think, from a more liberal point of view, um, a, a more powerful objection, really, which is that there isn't any need for the government to get, be getting involved in this in the first place. Even if the policies could be shown to work, uh, what, what is the cost-benefit analysis and why aren't individuals capable of making that cost-benefit analysis themselves? If somebody um, has made the decision to smoke cigarettes because they really enjoy them and they are prepared to take the risk uh, the, the risk of smoking which, of which they are very familiar then I don't see why the government should be getting involved and the same applies to alcohol the same applies to um, food and soft drinks indeed I would say it's a perfectly rational decision for many people to be prepared to be overweight or obese because they really don't like exercising and they really like eating sugary, drinking sugary drinks and eating fatty food. There's nothing irrational about that. So unless the government can put forward, forward a solid um, economic argument for why it needs to introduce these policies, then I think that alone is enough for them not to be introduced. But yeah, the, the fact that these policies so rarely work, I mean, you mentioned sugary drinks before. I mean, there's just, there is just zero evidence that sugary drinks even affect how many calories people consume, let alone how many people are obese. And if you turn around and say that to the campaigners several years after a sugar tax has come in, you say, well, where's the reduction in obesity? They accuse you of being incredibly naive for thinking that there would be any kind of reduction in obesity. They say, oh, it's a complex problem. There's no magic bullet. Well, you weren't saying that when you were calling for this tax, right? And you're saying it's horrendous how many people are obese, therefore we need the sugary drinks tax. If you'd have said, we want a sugary drinks tax, but it's not going to affect obesity, I don't think maybe we would have introduced it. So it's, it is important to go back um, and not be constantly fighting the next battle, but also go back and remind people that the previous policies hadn't made any effect. The, the, the promises that were made were not fulfilled. And so maybe we should be skeptical about the same people when they come along with very similar policies to, uh, to move forward. Because they always want to move forward. They want to forget about what's happened and move on to the next thing. Um, but we shouldn't let them. Um, if you want to eat yourself to death, go ahead. It's, it takes time. But I mean, if the governments want to tax you not to eat yourself to death, I mean, Where's the sense of that? Just to gain money from not getting people fat. It's, it's crazy. Certainly, but that, that's a very individualistic uh, kind of attitude towards life, which 
probably doesn't apply to the vast majority of the people. Uh, so my, my thought on this is that we started to include so many different policy areas within the large political realm. Um, and try to decide everything through representative elected governments um, that everyone feels frustrated that they are not getting their way, right? But this is kind of the philosophical argument that um, there are important issues and obesity and lung cancer and all of that is, is definitely a crucial human issue to solve. But the question is whether it's best solved through representative governments and the corresponding regulations. And I think free marketeers um, do have a pretty good philosophical foundation to say uh, no, and not just on a utilitarian basis, but more of a, more of an individual um, philosophical basis as well. Yeah, well. The question basically, especially in the Nordic or the welfare countries where um, the health service is publicly funded. It, it, the question is if whether it should be limited somehow. If you have smoked your whole life, should we actually operate the lung cancer? If you have uh, drank the fizzy drinks for the, uh, the for your whole life and you weigh like 250 kilos, whether uh, you should get the fat surgery? Whatever it is, or the hip replacement. Chris, you actually looked into these numbers. So yeah. the argument that a lot of these unhealthy consumptions lead to increased public costs, um, does that actually stand up to scrutiny? Generally speaking, no. Um, and it, it is certainly the most common argument that you hear from people. I actually disagree with a bit, Adam, when you say that the vast majority of people don't share a kind of vape broadly liberal view of this. I think actually most people think if people want to smoke, then they should be allowed to smoke. They just don't necessarily want to have to breathe in the secondhand smoke. If people want to consume you know, fizzy drinks and chips and get fat, I don't think most people uh, particularly object to that. We, we hear a lot from the more extreme people who, who feel very strongly that uh, they should do as they're told and eat their greens, but I don't think that's the mainstream view. The mainstream view, however, is that if it's costing them money, if it's costing the general taxpayer money for people who are dying of lung cancer or getting fat or drinking themselves to death, then it does become a, a, a matter of, uh, of concern for them and therefore a matter of concern to the government. Um, it doesn't really stand up, and the reason it doesn't stand up is it's really fairly obvious. It's that people who smoke and people who drink themselves to death and people who are obese pay taxes like everybody else does. So they are only getting the health care that they've paid for. The question is, are they costing more than, the, than a healthy person who lives to the age of 95? Um, and are healthy people paying more in tax for people who are unhealthy? And the economics of it are actually really quite clear um, that they don't, that people who live to 95 are costing society uh, significantly more than people who are living to 70 or, or 75 because everybody will die, everybody will have health care costs uh, pushed up uh, at the end of their life. That's where most people take up about 50% of their entire healthcare costs. So that, those costs can't be avoided. They can only be delayed. And in that period in which they're delayed, you are having hip surgery and cataract surgery and taking pensions from the public pot and various other things. So the economics of it are actually quite the reverse of what most people think. To be honest, I think even if that were not the case, and I think in certain areas it, it might not be, there are some examples where unhealthy behavior um, can lead to chronic conditions which don't actually kill people, but they, they live a long time in, in bad health, and they probably do end up being a net cost to the general taxpayer. But I think it's I guess, philosophically a pretty difficult argument to make that you are going to force people into a state-run healthcare system and then because you have kind of induced these externalities, you're going to tell people how to live. So you're forcing them into the healthcare system and then forcing them to behave in a certain way so they don't cost other people uh, too much money. I think that is in itself quite a dangerous uh, idea, which of course could be extended to all sorts of other activities in life. It could be extended to people who play sport, who, who use up emergency departments at a, a, a much higher rate than people who go out drinking. 
um, and all sorts of other you know, ex extreme sports, dangerous activities, who knows what. Where does, it, where does it end? Well, it doesn't end. If you are looking for maximum um, you know, taxpayer efficiency, then the, the scope for the government to control people's lives is almost limitless. Indeed, this utilitarian perception can be quite scary if you take it to the extremes. Um, are there any other questions on the floor? Yeah, sorry, because I don't want to monopolize the mic, but let me ask just another question. Okay. We, we have plenty of time and, and we are gonna, you're going to make questions too. Uh, and, well, thank you so much for your answers. You, you really made a, a good point, uh, Christopher. It, it really helped me. But um, I also have another question. As we are uh, talking about smart regulation, I want to know, um, I mean, of course, the, like, the ideal uh, scenario is uh, one in which the government is not like telling us what uh, what we have to do, but what would what do you think about, for example, these initiatives that try to push uh, or not maybe or sometimes to force you, but sometimes it's voluntarily that uh, you have like to show the carbs, for example, that your meals have in a fast food uh, chain. Let's say in, in the U.S. It's, it's super typical. I'm not sure if, if it's mandatory or not. But what do you think about this this kind of initiatives? It's an interesting one um, because uh, I mentioned information asymmetries before, and I think it is quite plausible that a lot of people don't realize how many calories are in certain products. Um, I think soft drinks are actually a good example of that. I think one of the few good things that the anti-sugar campaigners in Britain have done over the last few years is inform a lot of people about how much sugar and how many calories are in you know, think products like Coca-Cola, which I, I suspect a lot of people didn't realize there were that many before. Um, it's possible that there are people who don't realize how many calories there are in um, you know, meals served in, in restaurants or in, in fast food chains, it's possible. So I don't think there's a very strong liberal argument against having calorie labeling on food. I don't think there's a strong argument against having it in McDonald's. Um, it gets more difficult, however, when, you're, when you bring in a law, as the UK government plans to do, to apply mandatory calorie labeling across the board to every pub, restaurant, cafe, bar because it's quite easy for Starbucks and McDonald's to do it. They're very large chains. They have standardized portions. They don't change their menu very much. Most restaurants want to change their menu very regularly. If you want to have a different soup of the day, every day, um, having to get some scientists to come in and tell you how many calories are in that portion and then make exactly the same size portion every time, that is a significant cost. Um, and it's a kind of unintended consequence governments don't tend to think about very much, um, but it's a real problem. It would, it would limit consumer choice because suddenly restaurants are just going to limit their menu. So we need to be a bit clever about how we think about these things. There is no libertarian argument against giving people information, but there could be quite good economic arguments um, against it when you look about actually how, how is it going to work in practice. Um, how about civil servant who actually um, goes around the restaurants and calculates the calories so the entrepreneurs wouldn't have to use the resource? Good job. That, that was a joke. <laughs> Juan? Okay, so just in case Irune uh, takes the mic away from me, uh, I'm going to ask three totally unrelated questions. Uh, the first one would be, uh, so I think at this point it is clear that taxation uh, is meant to maximize uh, revenue. If you, well, if the government wants to, to get rid of some sin goods, sin products, uh, in the short run, it bans them. In the long run, it tries to educate uh, people. So, um, have you seen any attempt to change uh, the healthcare system so that even though people who are consuming these goods end up paying uh, the price through taxation, they uh, explicitly pay more because of their uh, individual decisions uh, in freedom, so in short, because of their, so that they are being responsible from their actions. Uh, the second question would be if the nanny state index has studied uh, inequality in the sense that evidence shows that uh, all these policies affect differently uh, different sectors of the population, uh, particularly poor people, 
as they often are uh, less educated, and also because these same products tend to be or has, have been historically uh, cheaper than the bio uh, sector of any supermarket. Um, thirdly, you spoke before about um, um, the, how, how ridiculous it is, how the absurdity of having different policies uh, within a single market. But don't you fear that if there is some sort of uh, harmonization when it comes to regulation, it will be towards a more stricter uh, regulation and not the opposite? In which case there is essentially no escape from this paternalistic state? Sure. So quite a lot to unpack here. So let's start with the first one, reforming the healthcare system. And do you think that there are tendencies to make it more individualistic in the sense that um, it's a health insurance-based system, unlike uh, in the UK or Finland, that it's just provided by the government? Yeah, I hear people sometimes make the case, usually on the libertarian side, that none of this would be an issue if people just paid for their own health care. And it's the fact that we have socialized health care in, in most European countries to, to varying degrees that justifies nanny state action. I think that that is naive. Um, I think that they're making the mistake of assuming that the arguments of their opponents are sincere when they're not. Um, I don't think when campaign groups say we must bring in these taxes and these regulations because of the cost of the healthcare system, that that is actually their real motivation for wanting to do it. I just don't think they like people doing these things and they want them to stop. Uh, and so when it is shown, uh, as many studies have, that actually smoking in particular has the biggest literature on this, that smokers actually do not have a net cost on, on the taxpayer. They actually have a net saving. Um, people never say, oh, in that case, fair enough, people should be allowed to smoke. They just move on to a different argument. So you have to get through various different insincere arguments before you find out what's really bugging people. And if you look at America, which does have a much more um, a private, privatized healthcare system, there is no shortage of nanny state campaigners over there, quite the reverse. Um, they are gunning for these things just as much as anybody in Europe does, um, and they just use somewhat different arguments. So I don't think it's a sincere um, objection in the first place. Um, yeah, actually, Chris already a answered the question. When when the healthcare system is socialized um, and you live longer, you, you're more expensive. So. That's pretty much it. Sure. Uh, and the second question was around uh, inequality and um, the economic well-being of individuals. So do you think that there is kind of an arrogance um, from politicians? And sorry for adding to your question, but do you think that there is some sort of attitude towards calling certain types of food junk foods and regulating cer certain um, pleasureful behaviors? Um, that links directly to social class and economic well-being? Enormously, and, and it always has been. You know, the, the, the current public health movement is only the latest incarnation of the kind of middle-class reform movements that have gone on for well over a century. Uh, and if you look at the targets, um, that is, I think, very, very clear. I mean, when smoking was very common across the social classes, it was dealt with by education and relatively small taxes. Today, uh, across the EU, um, you see smoking far more common amongst people on low incomes and almost non-existent amongst the, the, the very rich and the, the kind of people who might work for the European Commission and, and, the, and domestic governments. Um, and it's no coincidence that you see a far more punitive approach uh, you mentioned junk food. There is no real definition of junk food. We have food that is considered to be high in salt, sugar, and, and fat, and you will get that in every restaurant in Madrid, and it's delicious, and, uh, and no one seems to have a problem with it. It's only a problem when it's served in you know, American fast food chains. 
Um, so yeah, and I could go on about you know the the, the war on cheap alcohol. Uh, quite clearly, these sin taxes have much less an effect on people who can afford them, and they are very punishing for those who can't. So there are significant um, social equity arguments, and these taxes are absolutely unequivocally regressive, and they are perhaps the only regressive taxes that, that the political parties on the left approve of. Um, and then the last question was really around harmonization. So Chris, you described very much at the beginning that the EU plays an incredibly limited role when it comes to lifestyle regulations. It's mostly national governments or certain countries' regional governments um, that, that introduce um, these various regulatory frameworks. Um, in case the EU decided to step up its game on this front and try to harmonize certain aspects, do you think it would lead to more liberalization or less? Uh, well, less. Um, you're asking Siri. <laughs> <laughs> um, almost certainly less. I mean, not, if you're in Finland, it probably wouldn't make any difference, or probably the UK. But um, for most countries, it would tend to lift up the amount of regulation rather than reduce it. That ten tends to be what EU harmonization um, does. There is no obvious reason to me why they couldn't uh, regulate alcohol, for example, on a cross-European basis. Um, it's never really had a proper mandate for regulating e-cigarettes and tobacco um, because public health is not really an EU competence. They have only managed to do so by dressing it up as being market harmonization. But actually that doesn't really stack up. The ban on snus, which is a smokeless tobacco product, was initially proposed as being a market harmonization um, policy because the UK and Ireland were looking at banning it and they looked at the rest of the EU and said, oh, we need to have one or the other. We guess which way they went. Were they gonna force the UK and Ireland to, to sell it or were they gonna ban everybody else from selling it? They banned everybody else from selling it until Sweden was looking at joining in 1995, and the Swedes really liked snus, so they just said, oh, Sweden can have an exemption. So where's the market harmonization there? These, these are uh, nanny state policies dressed up as economic harmonization policies. There is no reason it couldn't do the same with, with alcohol. They brought in a, a tobacco advertising ban, for example, in the late 1990s. They could, in theory, bring about an alcohol advertising ban or alcohol advertising restrictions. There's, I don't see any reason why uh, you know, the, the constitution or the norms would, would stop them from doing it. They just haven't done it yet. So in this regard, you're saying that regulatory divergence across the member state does lead to better, more free market outcomes and more individual choice in this regard? Yeah, I guess so, because there are clearly some countries that don't want to go as far as, as the EU have gone. Um, there were very few countries. I mean, the e-cigarette issue is interesting because the Tobacco Products Directive was the spur that got countries like Denmark and Finland to actually legalize e-cigarettes. So from, for the people of those two countries, it was a positive move. However, the, 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 that particular directive didn't actually require these countries to do it. And in fact, they've made it very clear that if countries want to ban e-cigarettes outright, that's absolutely fine. And if more than three of them do it, they might look at banning them across the entire... Uh, you know, EU 27. So, yeah, generally speaking, um, I, I think having any kind of transnational regulation will tend to mean more regulation overall. Just as a, rem a reminder, the basic idea of the union is to give uh, individuals and businesses more freedom. So hopefully it will follow that. And we, I mean, for God's sake, since 95, we were supposed to give up the alcohol monopoly, but we still got it. So... Thanks, EU. <laughs> These things can take a long time indeed. And um, we have roughly five minutes left, so one or two questions. Um, yes, sir. Um, OK, I actually have two questions uh, for Chris. Um, excellent initiative, the Nanny State Index. But now, uh, and because you are British, and uh, Brexit, and all of this, and this was meant as a European Union Index, uh, what is the future of it? And then I would um, suggest extending it to the OECD countries, because there are many interesting countries in terms of regulations, like the Asian countries, Japan, South Korea, or Israel, which is also very peculiar. 
and Latin American countries in the OECD, like Mexico and Chile. So this is just as an idea. And the other one is about the coverage of the issues, because since you started the index, there are new topics, new things important, like um, cannabis. Uh, in the USA, as you know, many states have been allowing cannabis consumption. Uh, for both medical and even recreational purposes, and even in Europe, uh, countries like Portugal or uh, uh, the Netherlands. So those two countries, coverage of issues and coverage of countries. Yes, well, I mean, ideally, I would like to have it as a global index, but it's just the, the, the amount of work involved is, is just far too much for you know, relatively small think tanks to do. Um, I have been intending for some time to include other European countries and Britain's departure from the EU is a good kind of incentive to, to get that going. So I think the next time it's produced we will have at least 30 countries in there. We'll be including Norway and Iceland. Um, it would be nice to have Switzerland in. I think that's it's possible. I do rely on people living in these countries to help me out with the regulation. <coughs> It's not always easy to do. One of the good things about just having the EU countries in is that the European Commission does actually publish some quite helpful statistics about it. So, for example, they produce all the tax rates on tobacco, beer, wine, and uh, spirits. So it's quite easy to just get that spreadsheet and, and essentially copy it out. When you start looking at countries like Norway, suddenly you need to either have people in Norway who can help, help you you know, find out what the tax rates are or learn Norwegian and go online. Uh, a lot of these countries do put stuff out in English, but by no means all the time. And I suspect if we started including OECD countries, it would get progressively more difficult. So it is a big job. It's essentially a sixth month job, really, from start to finish, even as it is. And that's with pe people in most countries helping us out. So there's a limit to how much we can expand it, but certainly we'll have at least 30 countries when we publish in spring next year. In terms of expanding the, um, the number of issues, yeah, clearly we haven't got every nanny state issue in there. And we have talked amongst ourselves many times about should we include drugs, should we include sex work, should we include jaywalking? Um, how far are we going to go with this? You know, traffic laws. I mean, yeah, in theory, we could we could expand it to all sorts of things. That, of course, means that, that there is more work every time. Gambling, I would like to see in there. I noticed when I tried to look at my my online gambling website this morning, it, it, it was blocked in Spain. Um, the there are real problems. I mean, the reason we've never had drugs in there in the past is simply because they're banned everywhere in the EU, so there's not much point in just having uh, a category where everybody gets 10 out of 10. I know there are a couple of countries where you have decriminalization, possibly you could give them a couple of points off for that. But now that Luxembourg is actually going to legalize, I th and, and we've got more countries, as you say, uh, legalizing for medical purposes, I think there's a good chance we'll put that particular category in there next time. Gambling seems relatively simple on the face of it. It's actually really complicated in, in practice, the European Commission doesn't have any data on it. I've struggled to get any data from anybody in the industry. And each country has such a different range of gambling products um, that it's really difficult to compare them. Most countries will have a lottery. Most countries will have casinos unless they've banned them. But then you get kind of diff very different localized forms of gambling, which are not comparable from place to place. So, I mean, there's a huge amount of horse racing in the UK and Ireland, for example, but some countries don't really do it at all, but they'll do Kino or something, which we don't really have in, in Britain. So I, at the moment, I can't see much of a way of, of, of doing that. Possibly online, online gambling might be easy. I don't know, but I can't see us using that next time. The other stuff, sex work is probably, I think, too controversial. Jaywalking, perhaps too trivial. Um, so I think we'll just stick to cannabis for the time being. Um, we are running out of time, but I have a last question. And I know that the Christmas period is over, but if you have your Christmas wish list, what kind of absurd nanny state regulation would you like to get rid of on that Christmas wish list? What's the most you know, outrageously stupid uh, regulation anywhere from the EU28 or EU27 now that you don't want to see in the 2021 edition of the index? Well, I like the one in Finland about licorice pipes, which I believe Norway has the same, the same law, which is that licorice pipes apparently are quite popular in some Nordic countries. <laughs> 
Um, but they are regulated as tobacco products because they look like, sort of like a tobacco product. So they, they have to be kept behind screens in, in, in shops, can't be advertised um, in any way. The other one, slightly more seriously, would be, I mean, I'm against the sugar tax in general, but quite a few countries tax um, sugar, uh, well, tax soft drinks which have no sugar in them under the sugar tax, which I think gives the game away that this is about raising revenue rather than reducing sugar consumption. But it's, it is patently absurd, even if you agree with the idea behind the sugar tax. Two minor details, both from Finland. Um, I, I would be happy if ice cubes weren't taxed as soft drinks. <laughs> Uh, and then I would also be happy if I could carry my own pint, which I bought from the bar, to the park terrace outside, because there is a pedestrian walkway in between. It's not allowed for me as a consumer to carry my own beer to the park terrace. So if I get rid of that, I'm really happy. We have our goals for the next index. Um, there are many copies just right outside on the table with a lot of weird and a lot of strange... Um, lifestyle regulations, so do take a copy with you. Thank you so much for the discussion, thank you for the two speakers, and please look out for the next index in roughly about a year's time in 2020. Thank you very much. Thank you.